And the Holy Spirit, when he comes, will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. John chapter 16, verse 8. That's what we've been considering. So, Lord, as we think about this verse, that you will, Lord, penetrate our hearts, even our thick skulls, and enable us to hear, to listen, to respond, and so to live in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So that's where we've been this week, and it's been an exciting discovery. And here it is written down in cold print before you. The spirit and conviction of sin. Now, John extends his idea here, and he says, what does sin mean? And he says, specifically, it means their rejection of Jesus because they do not believe in me. And we see a wonderful instance of what that rejection looks like and that what that conviction looks like in John in, in Acts chapter two. Here it is. Peter has just delivered the first sermon on the day of Pentecost. And this is what follows. When they, the crowd, heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of his apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them saying, be saved from this perverse generation and so then those who had received you know the, this is where the church began it began with the coming of the holy spirit and it began with the conviction that the holy spirit brought and the conviction was of unbelief in jesus christ so the spirit comes to convict us of sin because we do not believe in Jesus. It's specifically the sin of unbelief that's being talked about here. So the Spirit comes to convict the world and bring to repentance. That's part of his conviction role. The world has a sin problem, and Jesus is the answer. And it he becomes the it's like the fulcrum and the whole. The whole balance of the world is out of joint, but he provides the fulcrum. He provides the balance. He provides the, when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true living way. He was, I am the door. He was bringing it into himself. This is what sin is. It is how we relate to Jesus. So this means that people who sin without Jesus are in trouble. And the Holy Spirit is here to convict those people. So what do you say to a sinner? How do you get him to desire Jesus? Well, that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit convicts us of unbelief in Jesus. What, what must we do? Repent, be baptized, and he will fill you with the Holy Spirit, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that's what the Holy Spirit is about. That's his business. That's his purpose in our community, in our world. He's a voice of rebuke. And second, he's a voice of righteousness. And the next verse, verse nine, Jesus says he convicts concerning righteousness. That's interesting, isn't it? And there's a variety of ways you could think about that. He convicts a sinful world for their lack of righteousness. He brings people to an understanding of sin, and then he shows them their need for righteousness, and he causes them to desire it. And we desire it like, like water in the desert, like because without the centrality of Christ in our lives, our lives are twisted and convoluted, and confused we're on a journey and we don't have a sat nav we don't have a a way a map and so this convicting of righteousness is showing us something in christ that is attractive 
that is decent whatsoever is pure and decent and honorable. Think on those things. Focus on those things. And here's another picture from Acts 16 of this what must we do to be saved moments. And this is the Philippi jailer. Do you remember the story? When the jailer awoke, he saw the prison doors were open. He drew his sword. He was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, don't harm yourself. We're all here. He called for lights and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas and after he brought them out saying, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So he'd, this is like a kind of revelation. It's like a kind of insight into what's going on. The powerful God of Paul and Silas had acted and he responds and he says, a response in the same words as on the day of Pentecost. What must I do to be rescued, to, 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 be, to be delivered from this dreadful confusion and darkness, this prison? I thought I was putting you in prison, but it was me in prison. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He convicts a sinful world and brings them to a recognition that that sin is a lack of relationship with Jesus. So that's one way of thinking about righteousness. And another way is to think about our self-righteousness. We have a perception of ourselves. It's funny, isn't it, how we look down on everybody else because they sin differently to us. And we sort of secretly have an idea, bad as we are, that we are not so bad, <laughs> not as bad on a scale of Mother Teresa to Hitler. We kind of frame ourselves in there somewhere. Ah. <laughs> and when the Holy Spirit goes into work in, a, in, in, in people's minds and hearts, he convicts a moral world of its self-righteousness. Do you remember how the, how the mob responded to Stephen preaching in Acts chapter 7? Right at the end, it says, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and began gnashing their teeth. See, they were exposed. The Holy Spirit had exposed something, but it exposed a self-righteousness which worked against Stephen, which killed Stephen. Do you, do you, do you see the difference here? The, the Philippian jailer, it, it pierced him to the quick. On the day of Pentecost, it pierced their hearts and they, what must we do? And in Acts chapter seven, it's saying, how dare you? It's the same Holy Spirit. It's the same conviction of sin, but there's a different result here. Okay. So he convicts the world concerning righteousness because he says, Jesus said, I go to the father and you no longer see me. See, when Jesus was there physically among them, he was a model of righteousness. You could see what righteousness looked like. He was the one who knew no sin, who fulfilled the law, an embodiment of, of decent living, a continued example. But he's gone. So who, where's the model of righteousness now? Well, the answer is Holy Spirit. He convicts the world of righteousness. He confronts self-righteousness. He confronts the human heart. And it's going to go one of two ways <laughs> into acceptance or rejection. But he provides that convicting moment. We can't make people desire righteousness, but the Holy Spirit can. He's a helper. So he's a voice of rebuke. He's a voice of righteousness. And tomorrow we'll pick up this last one. He's a voice of reality. Lord, we pray that we may be absolutely clear of your righteousness, be absolutely clear of our own self-righteousness, and be clear of our need for repentance, our need for self-realization, to have a sane estimate of who we are and where we are, and to, well, when it's appropriate, even every single, Lord, what must I do to be rescued? What must I do to come out of this darkness and confusion? Just repent, be baptized, 
be filled with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is both the architect of our self-discovery and the, the builder of our new life. May the Lord bless you. And as we continue to serve, to work, to think together and to come close to him, our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you today.